what you do, I think you're gonna. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. All right, welcome to um, part two of uh, Los Angeles Poet Society uh, storytelling series, storytelling and poetry series that I've been doing for API Heritage Mind as part of my Instagram takeover. Uh, we welcome our guest uh, storyteller, Ami uh, Masmuda, who is also the author of The Toss Bearers, uh, published by Penguin, Penguin India, right? right? That's right. Yeah, and it's available now on Amazon, so go get it. And let's get into more stories. Welcome. Thanks. Here it is. And yeah. then next year it'll come to the uh, to a U.S. publisher in 2022. So stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, you can pick it up. <laughs> yeah. So thank so, you. No, thank you so much for having me. And and it's been so nice. Our first session was really great, sharing some ideas, some stories, and um, and hearing your original table was great. And I think. Um, it's it's as we were saying earlier. It's through these stories that we get so enriched because we've as soon as we share, we both have that that thought, that idea, and we've we've both grown from it. So look forward to more. Yeah, awesome. So let's get into. Uh, so we covered Chris now, uh, now, which is was we did in the earlier conversation as well. Now he was actually you know his even his name means black, and he was as black as the night. And that mm -hmm. how kind of debunks the post-colonial colorism because in pre-colonial times we embraced you know different colors you know like Absolutely. and so Krishna had almost like a his spiritual twin right in a way um, yeah property, but her name was also kind of Krishna right yes yes like yeah. Yeah, so Krishna, um, Draupadi, um, her name is Krish so Krishna and Krishna. So you've got the, the typical, um, you know, Sanskrit, uh, that's how Sanskrit deals with gender is that uh versus ah. And um, uh, it, it, right, and, the longer and so, pronunciation, right? Right, 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 yeah. right. So that's uh, that that's her name, and uh, yeah, she and Krishna have the spiritual mystical connection because she's not actually related to him. Her story is interesting because she is born out of the fire. Mm -hmm. So her father, um, there's a there's a long backstory, but in a nutshell, her father was um, best friends with Dronacharya, who's this, this uh, archery teacher for the. Uh, Pandavas and the Kauravas, these two warring cousins. And um, at, at one point, uh, Drupad and Dron had been friends and there was a king and a Brahmin. And so they had been friends and um, Dron became very poor. And when he approached Drupad, Drupad was kind of like, well, we're not equal, so I'm not going to be your friend anymore. And there's, there was this break. And Dron went on to then train these Pandav and Kaurav princes. And they, he trained them so well. And when they asked him what they could do for him, uh, he said, well, I want you to bring me Drupad, bring me this king. And mm -hmm. so um, the, the Kauravas try, they're not able to do it. And so the five, the hundred Kauravas, the five Pandavas then go and um, single-handedly, basically Arjun mainly does this. Um, Arjun, the archer, captures Drupad and brings him to Dron. And then they had this whole conversation and Dron reminds him of this kind of humiliation he had suffered at his hands. And so when Drupad, and then Drona lets him go, when Drupad goes back at this point, he's burning with two things. One is revenge and two is admiration for Arjuna. So mm -hmm. he asks for two, uh, he, he asks for two things uh, when he does this, this yagna, the sacrifice for uh, children. And so he asks for a child to kill Dron eventually. And he asks for a child to marry Arjuna. So he wants two things basically. And so from the fire comes Drishtadyumna, who is uh, his son. And uh, he is born of the fire and he's born uh, fully formed as a youth uh, with armor and everything. And he ends up actually training with Dron, even though Dron knows he's gonna kill him. Mm -hmm. And so that's Drishtadyum. And then the other being to emerge from the fire is, uh, is fireborn Draupadi. Um, and so son of, uh, daughter of Drupad Draupadi, but she's also known as Krishna. And the description of Draupadi is that she's an unparalleled beauty. And uh, when she emerges from fire, her skin, um, her skin is the color of a black jewel, a black barrel um, jewel. And so her skin is as black as a dark black jewel. And her hair is basically so dark that it's, it's almost blue. And so she's this, uh, you know, dark skinned with blue hair, uh, beauty, and she's supposed to exude the fragrance of the blue lotus. So she's like, 
fragrant on top of everything else. <laughs> and um, and then and and I think the part that I think most people associate with Dropi is that this this being born of fire means she's got this fire. And so she's, um, you know, uh, I think always in a state of this, this kind of intense energy and, um, and almost like, uh, unfortunately her beauty, I think causes, uh, there are moments when she is, uh, you know, obviously treated poorly, humiliated, she's, you know, uh, molested and, uh, like fire that, that action ends up burning eventually the person who does the molesting. And I don't think it makes it any easier on Dropadi as a character, but um, you've got this like symbol of this uh, of this fiery woman who is um, who who literally just kind of burns, um, you know, in, in in many different ways. So so her description, um, and again, when when you see her in the um, in the series or in in a, in a book, she'll always be in a post colonial depiction. She will always be. Uh, just a, a standard, fair, you know, fair-skinned yeah. um, woman, mm -hmm. and and it's it, it's so inaccurate. I don't think anyone thinks twice about it. And then if you actually read Veda Vyasa, it's like it's in your face how many times she's referred to as as Krishna, as as black, and as an extremely beautiful. And and I say and because I think, and I've probably heard this in you know some you know various aunties or uncles have probably said this where they'll say, oh, she's 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 dark, but she's pretty. You know, and the and the but is is indicating to you that uh, if 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 they're dark, how can they be pretty, right? And that's where that's the whole that's that's exactly the colonial mindset of um, of, of of darkness kind of being a hindrance to beauty as opposed to an enhancer of or one among a spectrum of beauty. And so I think that's when we kind of um, go back to these ancient stories and we think uh, and we kind of merge them with our understanding of of our diverse world, um, we kind of have this beautiful understanding of the spectrum of beauty, um, all the colors of, of skin tone, um, of hair, of, of all these of all these aspects of um, of diverse beauty. And I think um, it it's nice when we kind of can remember that and 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 you know kind of un undo that uh, that insidious uh, colonizing that happens in, in our minds because of of that gaze, you know, that, um, that legacy, unfortunately, but, yeah. um, but I, I feel like there's hope when we read the original text. And when I, I tell kids, I, I talk to a bunch of, um, junior high school students and elementary school students, and especially with the junior high school, I told them, go back to the original text, read those texts. Cause that's where mm -hmm. all of this is. And, um, I think in the interim period, a lot of that got kind of swept away or, 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 or distorted. And so we have to, um, we have to go back to those stories, I think. Yeah, it's always so important to read the original source text, you know, like, yeah. uh, like I was telling people uh, on a different note, like even, for example, the Tao Te Ching, right, which yeah. uh, the most popular translation in the West is written by a white man, Stephen Mitchell, uh, yeah. And whose wife is Byron Katie, who turns out to be very problematic and racist as herself. So, uh, in, in the way she gets life, you know, Black women and her workshops and things like that. Um, mm. So, when it comes to even that book, I recommend instead the very thick translation by Jonathan Starr. Now, even though he's also a white man, what I like about his version is that, in addition to his own translation, he also provides the verbatim character by character Chinese translation. And that's why it's so thick, wow. thick like this. Oh, wow. Oh, that's yeah. remarkable to be able to do yeah. that. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you shared that. I'll have to add that to the library. But yeah, and, and translation yeah. can also be um, a, a double-edged sword, right? It can be, be mm -hmm. very problematic because you can make it simplistic. And my husband mm -hmm. has translated um, the Bhagavad Gita. And mm -hmm. one of the things he struggled with a lot, and, and I think he came through because he's a poet as well. I think he mm -hmm. was able to do it well is because he was really seeking. Um, I think a lot of translations tend to have an agenda to push, you know, there's like, there's a, there's a particular sect they, you know, are, are promoting or something. And for him, it was very important for him to capture what the language and the spirit 
um, of the Gita was trying to do. And so um, I loved what you said about having that those individual words. And so he spent a lot of time with each word and the and the etymological background of it in Sanskrit and then also in English because they have that common family tree mm-hmm. of the language. And so that you know, watching that process, I realized that, you know, translation, we take it for granted, but there could be so much that can go really well, but unfortunately things that can go very wrong. And so, you know, that's, that's interesting. And I think a lot of times when we access ancient texts, we also have to pay attention to what the translator is doing and who the translator is and what their agenda is, you know, as well. So no, that's that's a great point. The cultural context and language, right? In that, in the, Introduction to that book, Jonathan Starr points out that I think, uh, I don't know which is which, I forget, but like he was talking about how between the Chinese language and the English language, one is a perceptual language and the other is a conceptual language. And so in order to translate, uh, things get lost in translation, even because of that people miss those uh, context clues, you know. Right. Right, no, yeah. I would imagine so, right? Yeah. And it's complex being bilingual or almost mm-hmm. trilingual myself. I, I I, struggle with that if I'm trying to explain something to my kids, like if their grasp of say Gujarati is not as strong, then I'm trying to convey something, you know, and and you start to run into where um, the language just doesn't do it. And you have to, the translation just doesn't do it. They have to just get it um, by hearing that context or hearing it in a story or something. And, and so you're right, language comes with so much culture that, uh, mm-hmm that we have to yeah. kind of um, you know, keep that as, as a package almost. Yeah, and the other thing I wanna point out about, like even today, like going back to the colorism, you know, there, there is a lot of uh, continual, continuous narrative warfare uh, against the color black, like with subliminal messaging embedded into yeah. it. Like even for example, if you look at a lot of uh, uh, fantasies, uh, written by white men, whether in movies or TV series or even books, that you would always see uh, darkness depicted as evil and light depicted as good. And then of course there's the white man who is the the white savior, uh, that, you know, that trope. And and often it's very subliminal and hidden, but sometimes it's very blatant. Like a friend of mine gave me this uh, astounding example from, uh, anime uh, from, it's originally from Japan, but it also, you know, some of it crossed over here to the United States. And apparently there is a, there is this story of this character called Goku from Dragon Ball Z. And Goku had an alternative uh, evil personality called Goku Black. Like his evil alter ego is literally called Goku Black. And he's from a parallel universe, right? And and then there is an incident that happens when uh, the, the good Goku, the light-skinned Goku, uh, somehow is turned into looking like Goku Black from the you know, alternative universe. And, and so he's mistaken for Goku Black and he's surrounded by police and cops and they're about to you know, suit him. And, and literally the, the, the movie line, right? is you know, one of his friends shout at the cops and saying, don't shoot, he's not black. Oh, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh and it's so, it's so painful, especially in, yeah. in today's, um, in yeah. today's um, context of, 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 my, yeah. of events and stuff. So that, yeah, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking how those things, um, Kind of unfortunately ha- have this have this impact, and um, mm-hmm. you're right sometimes subliminally as well. Um, and really interesting because I think part of um, decolonizing is I agree with you, kind of separating um, this notion um, of uh, you know darkness, like kind of uh, symbolic darkness, you know, mm-hmm. and and that like I think every culture has this idea of dark, dark and light, you know, um, in terms of concepts you know and then and then separating that completely from skin tone which is obviously totally different because you have I mean basically it's it's a completely different mechanism if you're talking about melanin at this point you're talking about you know individuals and and no no one color is the same either in that Mm -hmm. in that context but um but but what I was thinking about when you were saying this is the um 
is the ancient concept of the mother goddess in which she mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, two sides of her are Gauri and Kali. And yeah. Gauri literally means, um, you know, the white one and Kali is, uh, is, is black. And mm. it, in that case, it's, it's really amazing. And, and Kali actually, both Parvati or Gauri and Kali show up in my, in my book. And mm. um, I don't want to, you know, give away any spoilers, but um, there are times when you really need that form of the goddess that is Kali, that is extremely mm. strong. And that is, um, you know, uh, the, a fierce defender of um, of her children, of of you know basically of the world, and um, and is willing to fight um, against evil. And so it's really interesting because um, I think you know in ancient cultures um, you don't you don't see as much of that association of uh, you know a bad and black, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like that's unfortunately become a post colonial. Um, you know, uh, recurring theme, and and it's and it's totally it's 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 terribly unfortunate. And I think we have to work very hard. I think as as each community does to uh, to kind of pick that apart and um, and be able to to discuss it, uh, you know, without and I'd rather discuss it honestly with the, the historical pain that it, it comes with, and and even the modern day um, problems that come with it, but also kind of hopefully take it out of that and be able to look at these ancient stories and see the beauty in both of those forms mm -hmm. of uh, the goddess, for example, the beauty in both of those colors. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's always interesting to me. It's almost like she's like, um, like, like when you turn a diamond uh, to, in different directions and you see, mm, the, you know, the, the all facets, her different yeah. colors and her facets. And, and so it's really interesting to me that she's, um, she's the same, she's the same goddess and she's the same power. Um, and mm -hmm. she's the symbol of strength and she's, uh, depending on uh, what the need is, what she has to do, she will transform. And, and so you have, um, you know, and there's a lot, I think you and I were talking about that kind of exotification or, um, or uh, you know, demonic, you know, making someone demonic, demonic like there's one or the other. Yeah. 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 And I think um, that's interesting too, because I think Gali, the goddess really suffers from that, uh, you know, in terms of the gaze, obviously it doesn't, I don't think it affects her. I think she's fine the way she is. I don't think it bothers her one bit, um, so to speak. But I think when, when people look at that image, um, there tends to be uh, you know, I mean, everything from like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I mean, I'm a huge Indiana Jones fan, but like that movie did so much, I think, damage to this image oh, of yeah. this mother goddess who is supposed to be this, you know, this nurturing being who takes on a terrible form because she has to fight evil um, mm -hmm. and twisting, you know, twisting that image into something evil or and and something. And, 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 and lately, I feel like I saw images of like a very like sexually um, charged goddess you know and and i mean you know, the exotic our, our, side of it. right yeah. exactly i was gonna say yeah. our goddesses are, are are pretty sexy too like i don't think that's the problem i think <laughs> it's more that um it's more that what the what the what the gaze is trying to do or what the depiction is trying to do and and what is trying to pin on her and um i think that's that can be very it can be very problematic and we kind of have to you know reclaim and i think to reclaim um, we have to understand like what what she stands for and and what that uh, what that depiction is. And so um, it all goes back to to those stories and kind of finding finding her place and you know uh, finding her in those stories and then bringing her to life um, mm -hmm. in our understanding, I think. so yeah. yeah, maybe later on uh, I I think this is a good time to share my poem on breaking up with the I was hoping rate. you would. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and actually, uh, speaking of Gali and the dark light principle, I actually wrote a story also, which I can share later on flipping uh, that narrative. Yeah. Uh, and of uh, you know, darkness being evil and light being good. Uh, and the funny thing is when I was writing that story, uh, uh, Garuda actually came and she, it wanted to be part of the story and I had to let him. And, I totally you know, understand that, thing. that, like, gosh, that yeah, thing that you said, yeah. I can so relate. Mm -hmm. Like there were yeah. like, oh gosh, I totally understand. <laughs> like those, yeah. they, they're, they, gods can be persistent. Like they're like getting your head. You're like, okay, okay, I'm getting to you. <laughs> yeah. so, That's great. I'm glad I I'm not the only too, one yeah. to whom that happens. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> but I was also like rereading uh, Poetry is Not a Luxury by uh, Audre Lorde. And mm -hmm. I love how in that essay, like the whole essay is amazing. It is a poem of this, in its own way. Um, mm -hmm. But she actually flips darkness as well, where instead of calling it evil, she basically referred to it as uh, hidden and ancient. Oh, I love it. Oh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. I love that. That's that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a writer, I think I have to be aware of that as well. You know, like mm -hmm. those words that we use um, and the way that we depict that is, is, is very important. Oh, right. gosh, I love that. Hidden and ancient. I love it. Let me look for this poem on my word. This is one of my favorite poems. I'm actually pretty happy with the way it turned out because uh, normally like, you know, a lot of my poems are kind of indirect, you know, and that's why I also like to tell stories because I kind of, what I want to do is almost like uh, plant a seed inside somebody's mind and then mm -hmm. let it grow on its own into a plant mm -hmm. and a tree. And that way they feel like it's their own idea and it's more powerful that way. Absolutely. Uh, but sometimes I like to be more direct as in the case of this poem, because I don't want any room for misinterpretation. Sure, sure. Yeah, so this is the poem. It's called Breaking Up with the Demonization, uh, Exotic Perfection, False Binary. Every day I am peaceful and in turmoil. I am brave and I'm terrified. I feel hopeful and hopeless. I feel that I can carry mountains and topple empire. And I feel crushed. I feel supported and I feel betrayed. I want to stay and I want to leave. I want to yell and scream and I want to whisper and sing, sing, sing and whistle and appease. I want to hug you and bug you, tell you to fuck off. I'm strong and I'm weak. I feel beautiful and I feel insecure about how I look. I'm not your demon and I'm not your fairy. So stop demonizing me, stop pitying me, stop mocking me, stop exotifying me, stop fetishizing me, stop devaluing me, stop dehumanizing me. I'm breaking up with your demons and your fairies. That's your own delusion because you can't live with yourself. I loved it. I loved it. That's so great. And I think, I mean, I see so much in that with the contrasts mm -hmm. and, um, and, the, and the and, you know, I think, and this is what you and I were talking about where the false binary is the, is the, the necessity of having to choose when we so often are both, we're both strong and weak, we're brave and, you know, I mean, oh, that was beautiful. And I think um, it ends with such power and, um, and a demand and a taking back. So wonderful. Yeah. I love hearing that. Sure. Cause I feel like, you know, what you did with the fable was so different from what you did with the poem, but um, exactly. both, both, both very meaningful. Yeah. 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 I'm like, no, no, very... This is what I mean. <laughs> and yeah. And sometimes you just have to say what you mean and it yeah. has to be straight. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 There can be no room for, uh, for misunderstanding there. Yeah. So, exactly. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. I loved it. Yeah. Let's take a musical break. It's easier to edit when I do the editing and cutting. <laughs> I like that. that. Clips, yeah. <laughs> All right. So that's a good segue or a dovetail into uh, gender fluidity and you know other fluid concepts. You know because we're talking about false binaries and one of those false binaries is the gender binary. And you know the more I research this. Uh, a lot of this I learned from Alok Manan, who is South Asian uh, themselves and non-binary. And yeah. they often point out how the gender binary is not only a social construct, but also a racial construct because it was uh, designated not only around men and women, but specifically around how the white woman looks like and how the white man looks like. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So that, was, that blew my mind. That really opened my eyes. I'm like, wow. So that's why transphobia is also a form of racism. It's not just sexism. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. that's very interesting. Yeah. And I hadn't, yeah. and I know, you know, more and more, I think people are thinking in terms of intersectionalities, but that's a really good, that's a really important one to, to point out. I'm glad mm-hmm. you shared that. That's yeah. huge. So let's absolutely. have you, Sarah. Awesome story. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, in speaking to what you were saying earlier, that the, you know, the idea of binaries, um, you know, is something that often doesn't sit well or almost doesn't sound familiar to people of ancient um, of ancient traditions, right? Because the, the whole paradigm is different. There's everything is more of a continuum. Things are more circular as opposed to linear. Things are more uh, fluid as opposed to either or. And so this is the case, you know, when you think about, um, I mean, every, even the way that say demons are depicted, there's a lot, there's a lot of gray area there. They're not all evil. They're not all, you know, good. Gods are not all evil. They have, they have their, 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 you know, little issues, their pride, their, you know, they have plenty of things going on. So I think there's a lot of space for um, seeing nuance and seeing all these things. Um, Mm -hmm. One of my favorite concepts, uh, and that's the other thing when it comes to thinking about the divine, um, there's so much gender fluidity there. Um, you've got the divine feminine, you've got the, the uh, you know, the, uh, the father of the universe, but you also have this amazing concept of Ardhanar Ishvara. So Ardhanar Ishvara is, you know, Shiva on one half of the body and Parvati on the other. And, and the description is so beautiful where you've got a description of, of, of her eye and the shape of her eye. And then you've got the shape and the color of his eye and these, and these two different um, beings coexist, coexist in this one body. And so um, they are extraordinarily beautiful. And there's so much power in this being that's created um, by this, by this, by this combination, by this both. Um, and so it's, it, and there's this entire, I think there's an entire hymn on that. I feel like I've, I know I've danced to it and stuff, but you, you really get this sense of, um, of, of both uh, being so synergistic and, and so beautiful. Um, so there's definitely that. And then as you and I were talking earlier, um, the ancient stories and scriptures are really comfortable with uh, gender fluidity. And uh, it, it's, it's not really a thing. And, and, if, and I think um, in my research for another book I'm writing, I was reading about how um, you know, homosexuality became uh, criminalized under, I think it was the British rule, um, became a hanging offense for a while. And so these are things that um, I think we don't think about, but they are they are imposed on um, on an ancient tradition that was very comfortable with with mm-hmm. with all these aspects of life, and um, you know ne- never didn't even bat an eye many of the time. Often celebrated mm-hmm. um, these 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 fluidities, these differences. So um, one of our favorite stories about that is. Um, is the story of Arjuna, who is this hero of the Mahabharata war, uh, the Mahabharata epic. And he, in preparation for the war, which is, is how the epic ends, um, uh, ascends to heaven. And his father is Indra, the king of the gods. And he uh, finds himself in heaven, uh, having helped the gods fight a battle. And he's sitting next to his father, Indra, um, on the throne. And the apsaras, the, the divine um, dancers, the celestial dancers, are performing. And one of the upsetas, they're all extraordinarily beautiful, but one of the upsetas, um, you know, uh, sees Arjuna and she's, you know, ca- caught by his, by his handsome features. And he looks like another Indra next to, next to the God. And um, she dances and she is, you know, falling in love with him slowly in this moment. And that night she approaches Arjuna in his chambers and, um, you know, she, she, she goes there kind of half closed and um, her hair loose and she's uh, finds himself in front of uh, herself in front of him. And uh, Arjuna joins his hands to her and she's, you know, she's this extraordinarily beautiful woman and she's shocked that he's going to join his hands and greet her that way when she's obviously there for another reason. And so he says, you know, welcome mother. And she says, mother, who are you calling mother? And Arjun says, well, you are one of my ancestors' um, wives. You were both of us his um, uh, wife. And so I have to call you my mother. Um, and she says, I don't think you understand. Us upsaras, we upsaras do not age. 
And we are free of all these constraints, this marriage business, that means nothing to me. And so I may have had a liaison with your ancestor, but I'm me now, I haven't aged a bit and we can, we can do this. And Arjuna is pretty firm on this, although he, you know, obviously he has no problem having multiple wives, but in this case, he's firm. And so he says, I'm sorry, I can't bring myself to think of you as anything other than a mother. And she is, Urva, she is livid. She's, you know, she can't believe she's been insulted like this. And so she curses Arjuna that she says, you will lose your manhood. And Arjuna at that moment is shocked, but um, his, his father Indra arrives and Urva, she's like, I just can't, can't believe this happened. This has never happened. I'm so insulted. And Indra says to Arjuna, you know, this could work to your advantage because, uh, for a lot of reasons, but one of the biggest reasons is um, the, the Pandavas, the five brothers had um, one of the, the terms of their exile. This is a lot of backstory. Hopefully your audience is familiar or can read up on it, but mm -hmm. um, they had to go to the forest for 12 years and then spend the final year of their exile in hiding. Mm -hmm. And it had to be completely incognito. And if they were discovered, they would have to do it all over again were part of the terms. So Indra says to Arjuna, you know, this may be um, a blessing for you and you'll get a, uh, a, a new experience and you may enjoy it. And more importantly, you will have a way to hide your um, warrior uh, personality in that year if you take mm -hmm. this curse of yours as a blessing for that year. And so Urvashi modifies it for him and he kind of keeps that in his pocket to use when he needs to. And uh, fast forward to when he gets back to his brothers and his wife, uh, to Draupadi, they um, enter this kingdom of, um, in, the, in, the, in the country of Matsya and Virat's kingdom is, is where they go. And each Pandava decides what he's going to do. Um, and among them, Arjuna says, well, I have this this boon. Now I'm going to take my this curse as my boon now, mm -hmm. and I am going to be transformed and transform myself into Bruhanmala, the um, the the dancer. And um, he has, you know, in preparation for this, before leaving heaven, he took some time to learn um, dance and music and all these arts from uh, Chitrasen, who is the head of the Gandharvas, who are these celestial musical and artistic beings. And so we, we have these, you know, this beautiful image of the uh, supreme warrior becoming uh, a dancer. And, you know, instead of the bow string, he's now twanging the Veena string. And instead of, uh, you know, moving his body in martial movements, he's moving his body as a dancer. And, um, you know, as, as, you know, those of you who are both dancers and familiar with martial arts, there, there's often a lot of overlap there. There's a lot of strength and grace involved in both. And so um, I, I, I kind of, I love montages in movies. So I always imagine Arjun having this amazing transformation from his probably, you know, overly, uh, you know, macho world of just fighting, fighting, fighting into this very, very beautiful, very graceful, but also very difficult um, artistic world. And so he, he kind of develops this other side of himself, which I think it, you know, increases his, um, his, his strength eventually, as we'll see. So he comes to Virat's kingdom and he's all trained and he's ready to go. And so he puts on, um, he is known as Savya Sajin, one who can use um, his bow with both hands. He's ambidextrous. So both of his shoulders are scarred from the bowstring. And so he wears a blouse to cover it, which is very important because he's known for those scars. And, um, and then he, uh, uh, he, you know, walks into the kingdom and he, um, he's definitely, um, he's definitely starting out as a man, but as he transforms himself, um, Arjuna is now Brihanala and she walks into the, into the kingdom of Virat and is welcomed by the king. But the king is kind of wondering, well, you know, t tell me about yourself. And Brihanala says, well, I am Brihanala and I am ready to train your daughter in the, in the fine arts, in dancing, in music. And so Virat is like, well, are you sure you're not a warrior instead? And uh, Brihanala is like, no, I'm definitely a dancer and a musician and I'm ready to perform. And so she goes into the, into the inner quarters of uh, Uttara, the, the princess, and then 
uh, is is very popular among all the ladies. And, he, you know, she's she's telling stories and she's teaching them uh, songs and dances. And it's this it's actually ends up being, I think, a probably I would imagine a fun year for this this hero who had not had that experience. And so we see his, we we see his transformation into Brihanala as this as this very, very beautiful thing. And um, the 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 end of that year of exile um, ends in this dramatic way in which um, the Kauravas who are the cousins who are trying to out uh, the Pandavas from their exile, from their um, hiding, um, invade the city and they ride off with, uh, with, with the cows of the city. And it mm -hmm. just so happens that the other Pandavas and the king himself are away uh, fighting another battle and it's all orchestrated. So mm -hmm. all that's left in the palace at this point is um, Uttar Kumar, who is the, um, the prince. He's young, he's only like 16 or so. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he says, well, I would, I would definitely take on the entire Gaurav army, but I have no charioteer. What am I going to do? And so, um, you know, Draupadi hears this and she says, oh, don't worry, Brihanala is a wonderful charioteer. And Uttar Kumar is like, I'm not taking a woman to be my charioteer. And Draupadi's like, trust me, trust me, she's great. She knows she knows how to handle the horses. And so uh, Brihanala comes before um, Uttar Kumar and, and, and is, very, is very shy and is unable to uh, put on the armor. And so everybody has to help her. And she is now decked out in armor and then, you know, walks uh, toward the chariot and then they ride out, uh, Uttar Kumar and Brihanala ride out uh, to chase the cows and the goat of army. And when Uttar Kumar is uh, stopped in front of, Brihanala stops the chariot in front of the goat of army and Uttar Kumar takes one look at these heroes arrayed in front of him and he jumps out of the chariot and runs. He's like, I'm not, this is, I, I'm th totally th just kidding, not doing this at all. And so he's running away and um, Brihanala jumps out of the chariot and she runs after Uttar Kumar. And so her braid is trailing behind her and she's chasing after uh, Uttar Kumar and all the color was like, you know, she runs a lot like Arjun. We we played tag with him. That that run is <laughs> Arjun's run. And, and there's a lot of discussion and debate and, and nobody knows what to make of it. And so Uttar Kumar is finally Arjun, you know, catches him by the hair, or rather Bruhanala catches him by the hair and then drags him back. He's like, you know, she says, you're gonna drive the chariot, I'm gonna fight, uh, climb up that tree, pull those weapons down, and we're gonna we're gonna rout this army. And so uh Uttar Kumar is amazed at this, uh, that Brihanala is actually Arjun, this hero. And so uh, Brihanala ties up her hair and then rides out into battle. And then this is one of those battles in which Brihanala by herself faces this, this uh, arrayed uh, Kaurav forces, Bhishma, Drona, Karna, Duryodhana, everyone, and uh, soundly defeats them all. There's this entire battle. And, um, and all of them, especially Bhishma and Drona, are marveling at the grace and it's almost like uh, we we can kind of imagine that the grace that Arjun has developed in his year as Brihanala has now informed her uh, fighting abilities. And so you have this amazing, um, uh, you know, melding of these two skills and these two sides of Arjuna. Um, Arjuna and Brihanala kind of at their at their peak of uh, of, of of beauty and strength in this moment. And so that's how he, uh, you know, he, he announces himself as Arjun, he blows the, the shell, the conch shell, and then, um, uh, you know, uh, Arjuna or Brihanala is now transformed to Arjuna. And, uh, and then, and then obviously it goes from there. But uh, I think one of my, one of my favorite stories, because again, uh, when you read, especially in the, uh, in the original, um, there is, there is such a sense of uh, both both aspects of um, Arjuna being um, being extraordinarily powerful, being extraordinarily captivating, and being so necessary to this larger context of the story. And so um, you really see this continuum and um, and and the, and the fluidity between these two. So uh, I'm I'm so glad that you thought of this story and that I had a chance to read it again and tell it again and share it with you. So yeah, I feel like it was actually necessary for him to be gender fluid, uh, even in order to be the great warrior he is. Absolutely. Well be the great dancer, like Mr. Both and 
Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. you really notice like when you read it like that, that battle that, uh, that, that Arjuna fights as Brihanmala is, I don't think she's ever that strong, even in the rest of the Mahabharata war. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like in her form as Brihanmala, she, she routes the entire army and then she faces all of them again as Arjuna later. And it's not the same. And, and it's almost, right. it's, it's almost to me, like now that we're talking about it, I see this kind of amazing metaphor for um, mm. that acceptance of that other side, strengthening strength. this warrior. Yeah. The, the mama yeah. bear phenomenon, right? Like mothers yeah. can even lift up cars if they were going to save the child from Absolutely. that accident, right? Absolutely. Yeah, they suddenly Absolutely. have the strength, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think this, this yeah. kind of embracing of that other side of him unlocked mm. an, 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 a whole other set of, um, of, of, of abilities and of, um, uh, of both strength and uh, of dexterity almost, you know, he became almost more of a warrior because he had been, uh, and, and, and he had been, she, this dancer, this, uh, uh, this singer, this, this artist, and that, and th those two sides you see combining in, um, in, in them, in Brihanmala really. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm, I find, I find that transformation to be um, so necessary as you're saying, and so, and, and, and so compelling. Yeah. And even yeah. what you said about the fluidity between uh, muscle arts and dance, it yeah. actually reminds me of the Chinese language film, uh, Hero. And yes. Oh, that was a great movie. Yeah. And yes. there's total yeah. like, uh, juxtapositions between music, musical instruments, and their martial arts throughout the movie. Absolutely. The yes. Yeah. Yes, I agree yeah. with you. And I think um, I think the strongest. Uh, I think the strongest, and even like you know, athletes here frequently will incorporate dance into their training, mm -hmm. because because both of those aspects do um, I think do make someone a better athlete and a stronger warrior, or you know, and whatever they have to do. Uh, physically, because, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, exercise or strength becomes, you know, only one thing. And, and, and this is all to the detriment of this, this integrated um, uh, physical and mental ability. So um, absolutely, I think we can all take a page from Arjun Brihendala's story, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, kind of develop all those sides. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you also mentioned now dance helps athletes because you know, one of the ways uh, the gender binary is upheld is also through uh, homophobia, right? And how, you know, in some places in the United States, like the Midwest, you know, uh, if a man dances that's seen as too gay, and then too gay actually means too feminine, which is also a very misogynistic idea. So it's like both yeah. sexist and homophobic. Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And they use that to control, you know, men as well as women and, you know, keep that gender binary by saying, oh, you know, men cannot dance. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Right. And, and that's another thing that, you know, when you have, when you look to the ancient stories, you have Nataraja, the first dancer is, mm -hmm. is the, the male god Shiva. You know, mm -hmm. and again, Shiva is the one who's comfortable with Parvati being half of him. And, he, you know, again, there's right. this, there's yeah. this, it's, there's this, there's such a sense of comfort of when you have, you have Krishna who dances, you know, on, on, on the snake, you have Krishna who dances Ras Lila, who, who dresses as Radha and switches, they, they're switching their um, garments. There's this kind of fluidity there. And um, I think it's, it's really interesting to me that it is not um, perceived as anything less or anything, it, it, it just enhances and it kind of uh, enriches the entire um, art and enriches the story. And so you see that where all our gods dance, men or women, it doesn't matter. They're mm -hmm. all dancing and they're all dancing um, joyfully. Sometimes they're dancing out of anger. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of self-expression there in, um, in, in, in dance um, across the board, across the pantheon, I should say. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, another thing I want to address regarding fluidity is, you know, the, the pronouns, right, uh, in post-colonial versus pre-colonial languages, right? And, yeah. like, you know, after, you know, doing so much research on, you know, the gender binary, like, you know, I've, I've basically, you know, now identify as gender fluid, right? And yeah. I go by the pronouns now, 
paid them. Yeah. And, but I was actually interviewing uh, a Filipino uh, poet uh, who's uh, also identifies as non-binary and goes by they then. And they mm -hmm. were saying that in Tagalog, which is, you know, yeah, yeah. Of, Filipino language, yeah. Uh, their, uh, their pronouns are gender neutral. They're so it's called sure. Oh. And, oh. and so when their grandparents, you know, speak English, they, they're still attached to the Tagalog way of speaking. So right. they actually use he and she interchangeably when they speak English. Oh, so interesting. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, that's amazing. Yeah, it's that is amazing. You know? It's subconscious, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah, and how much language influences mm -hmm. that, you know, yeah. and how, how much, and, 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 and it's so, um, it's enlightening, I think, to, to, to everyone to have this kind of, um, th this, this part of the discourse kind of ongoing now, because I think it's, it's really kind of opening people's minds and it's opening the way we think of things and, um, and, and think of gender, think of words, think of pronouns, you know, that, and, and, and it's one of those things where, um, you know, a, a generation ago, there wasn't much thought given to it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think, and that, and I think this, it, it's all part of the, the opening up and the understanding and the increased awareness. And, and it's all part of that. And, um, I'm, I'm thankful when you, you know, when you share something like that, it, it shows us that it wasn't always like this. It wasn't always so, you know, exactly. this or that. And, 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 and so that kind of, uh, fluidity has, is, is, I think almost like a natural state. And then what came later was almost imposed on, on, on what was a natural, um, you know, rather open, rather uh, not judgmental, relaxed notion of all these aspects of life. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I I'm definitely, you definitely agree there. Because, you know, one of the, uh, one of the complaints from, from the more conservative people, you know, is, you know, another, another lie or gaslighting, right? When they say, oh, you know, there's a, the trans agenda or the queer agenda where like, oh, more and more people are becoming trans. That's not true. We've always been here. Yes. We just lost the language to describe it. Yeah. So yeah. now we're reinventing the languages, at least in English, to reclaim the languages and cultures that we lost. Absolutely. And language is, has so much power. Absolutely. It's absolutely reclamation. I, I completely agree with you. And it's, and it's, and it's empowering and it's empowering, you know, I think it's empowering for women to see trans people claiming their identity. I think it's empowering for, I mean, it's empowering for everyone. I think every group that asserts and reclaims or, um, or even just finds um, a way to express their identity um, empowers all the other marginalized groups. And so, you know, we all get stronger when that process happens. So um, it's wonderful. And it's, and it's really, it's really a lot, a lot to learn, a lot to grow from for all of us. Yeah, so let's take another musical break and then I'll, I will share my story on the dark light thing and then we can wrap I'd love it up. To hear it. Sure, I would love to hear it. Do you write typically on with pen or paper? Are you a typer? What do you, how do you like to? I type I'm, just, I'm always curious about people's process. So. Yeah. Lately I type because uh, when I write, uh, I tend to like write quickly because my, the words come faster than I can write. Yeah. So what happens is my fingers get tied very quickly because yeah. I'm trying yeah. to write so fast to in order right. to catch up with my brain or with the right, right. You're right. So that's why I prefer the time. Totally <laughs> yeah. relate. Yes, I'm yeah. the same way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so also giving credit where it's due. This is also partially inspired by uh, something that this black woman writer did, uh, she, uh, N.K. Jemison, she okay. wrote a trilogy of fantasy novels called the In Inheritance Trilogy. And in the first mm -hmm. novel, uh, The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms, uh, she, uh, she also flips the dark light thing. And in that novel, uh, there is 
there is the God of light and order, and then there is also a, a God of chaos and darkness. And in that novel, the God of light and order is the evil one, and then the God of uh, chaos and darkness is the, the good one. So she okay, into. I so love it. I was inspired, at first I was inspired by that, but in the second part, like I said, Garuda came in and it became something else. It became a little okay. deeper. Uh, awesome. So my twist on it is instead of having uh, the second deity be God, I made uh, that be the goddess. So okay. it's also there's the god of light and order versus the goddess of chaos and darkness. That's the title. Okay. All right. Yeah. And it's almost written like a poem too. There is a melody to this one. Like, <clears throat> do you remember? the moment the light blinded you from that dark infinite void inside you, the fertile chaos that nourished the swell of your creative focus and expression. That was the light of the God of light and order. He wanted all the power in the world and the goddess of chaos and darkness disappeared from our eyes, existing everywhere, the empty dark of space, the darkness beneath the swell, and the dark void within us on the right side of our hearts, but hidden from you, only available for those who don't participate in demonizing her. Part two. Hello darkness, my old friend. It's been a while. I remember the first moment I discovered you. You were so different from the fancy fake bliss of white light. You were something else. A deep peace, a vast space, infinite rest, big relief. Deep breaths. My bird felt free from its cage of light and order imposed by those in power and privilege. My bird was a hummingbird at first, humming along merrily, 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 flitting about from one new original idea into another, one new hidden room to another in the newly discovered mansion inside myself. Now that so many previously locked doors were open, with each room it visited, it became stronger and stronger and stronger. It changed into a sparrow, then a parrot, and then an eagle, and then an albatross, and finally a Garuda, spreading its gigantic wings all across every room of my mansion. As it hugged it, all the walls fell down, total chaos, darker than it had ever been. At first, I was so scared. But the chaos freed me up even more because now there was no more order to hold me prisoner. All that was left was pure, infinite, chaotic openness that also contain infinite order, but so much more. Wow, that was awesome. That was awesome. I love this idea of chaos containing the order. Mm -hmm, and, exactly. and, it, and it's so, I mean, it's so like in keeping even with science, you've got this ever expanding universe, you know, on one hand, and then and then within it, you have all these intricacies that seem chaos. ordered. And then I mean, yeah. it's, you know, order within chaos, it's all bound mm -hmm. up. And I love it. And this idea that you have to let go of some of that light and order in order mm -hmm. to create and in order to, you know, mm -hmm. express and all these things. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And then the hummingbird growing into into Garuda was beautiful yeah. what, a, what an image 
Yeah, Garuda Ji oh. wanted to come in. I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. That's no, the no, story. No. I was like, all right, you're welcome. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, come in, fly in. <laughs> yes, no, no, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. What a, what a treat. I'm so glad that you shared. I, uh, you know, my, my husband's a poet and um, I am, because of him developing an interest in poetry, but um, mm -hmm. it's always nice. Uh, it's always amazing for me to hear the different ways in which poets use um, both sound and rhythm and then image and I think your poem combines all of these things very beautifully um so yeah. wonderful <laughs> yeah exactly yeah I like his poem dot head uh, it's almost like we've come full circle because your story your personal story about the bindi and not knowing yeah. what to say coincides right. with his own story about the bindi also and that's why he wrote the poem dot head right so right amazing. yeah yeah, and that poem really speaks to that that insecurity mm -hmm. that all of us of mm -hmm. um, you know South Asian you know Hindu mm -hmm. identity have have felt and experienced, and uh, mm -hmm. but then but then the kind of desire inside us to be able to express um, the magic, the meaning, you know, all these things um, to the outside world, and uh, I think through arts and stories and all is, is how is how we do it, you know, one one story at a time, one step at a time, one poem at a time. So mm -hmm. um, it's it's a it's a journey, but um, but you know it, we've, we've got to keep doing it. We've got to keep talking and sharing. So yeah, exactly. Not there. Be light. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Celebrates darkness and light, right? And both, yeah. both, absolutely both. both. And, yeah, and and, yeah. and and yes, mm -hmm. yes, <laughs> mm -hmm. for sure. So yeah, thank you so much for uh, joining us today for the Los Angeles Poet Society, and yeah. And, and then it was my stories. absolute pleasure. It was my absolute pleasure. It was an honor and. Um, I hope to connect with all the poets um, among you and uh, story, other storytellers. And thank you so much for sharing um, your fable, your poem, your story, and um, for inviting me to share. It was, it was a really enriching hour for me. So um, I truly, truly enjoyed it. And it felt, it felt very relaxed. It didn't feel like a thing. <laughs> it, was like, it was like hanging out with a friend. So I appreciate that. And I hope we can connect again like this soon. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that too. Eventually, I want to create a storytelling series on my own account as well, on my Instagram right. account. That's all. Yeah. More, more stories, the better. Sounds like yeah. a plan. <laughs> all right. Wonderful. All right. All right. Well, good night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. We'll, we'll stay in touch. Take care. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye.